Okay, let's go ahead. Today we're going to do a class on full plant nutrition. We're going to look at the minerals and we're going to look at the biostimulants. And, and a strategy of growing I call spoon feeding. where you are giving the plant exactly what it needs when it needs it. You still want a base nutrient which has all of the essential elements whether it's an organic fertilizer or a hydroponic fertilizer or some kind of combination. You want a good base but once you have the basic needs of the plants met, you can, get, you can steer the plant. You can make it a little more vegetative. You can increase rooting if you want to improve root growth. You can improve the quality of fruit and flowers. You can unstall plants if they get into a, a period where they're developing a hidden hunger just by giving them a little bit of what they need when they need it. So I'm going to show you some individual minerals and individual biostimulants today and uh, show you some strategies to make improvements to your garden. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the educational part. Plants are autotrophic. That means they're self-feeders. They make their own food. They use full-spectrum light and in the, take in carbon dioxide through the leaves, water through the roots, and then they, in the presence of chlorophyll and the red and the blue end of the spectrum for absorb, absorbing the energy of the sunlight, they make their own sugars. They're called photosynthates, the results of photosynthesis. Uh, some of those sugars they use for energy to grow and reproduce. Some they store in the flowers and in the fruits, in the seeds for the next generation. Some they even store in the roots, which is very important because if, if you can get a good balanced growth with lots of stored sugars, and including the roots, when the plant goes to flower, they can use that energy, that stored energy, they can burn it to bring in minerals like phosphorus and potassium to stimulate earlier flowering and more flowering sites to turn on carbohydrate metabolism to help those sugars flow to the flowers and the fruits. So it's a good idea to, to uh, have grow healthy high bricks plants from the beginning to the end to maximize quality and maximize yield. The minerals we're going to be talking about today are mined from the earth, individual minerals, they're processed into their water-soluble ionic form. Those are small electrically charged particles. Those are the forms of the minerals that the plant takes up through the roots. Plants cannot take up large organic molecules. They have to be broken down into ions by digestive enzymes from microorganisms for them to be available to the plant. So to treat or to pre prevent a mineral deficiency, we want to give them that specific mineral that they're missing in water-soluble ionic form so they can immediately take it up and, and treat and, and the, the problem and respond very quickly. Also, we can use individual minerals to steer the crop. The nutritional needs of the plant change at each stage of its growth and reproduction. So if we know that, we can give the plant what it needs when it needs it. If the plant's taking out certain minerals, we can put them back in. We can spark metabolism. We can spark photosynthesis for, for better quality, better yield. And also, we can improve the plant's natural resistance to pests and disease at the same time. Uh, the other side of the spectrum are the organic biostimulants. When plants are making photosynthates, some of them they leak from the roots to feed the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria in the root zone. And in exchange for those sugars, the microbes that live on the roots, that feed on the exudates, make biologically active molecules. And those molecules we call biostimulants. You can give the plant in very small amounts, but it has a physiological effect on the plant. So organic biostimulants improve the uptake of the minerals. We provide all the minerals in the fertilizer with those biostimulants, improve the uptake. We can also the more efficiently plants take up water and minerals, the more chemical reactions they can do, the higher the bricks. That's the sugar content in the sap. And that's our goal in all of my classes, to grow high bricks plants, to improve the nutritional value of food, to improve the medicinal value of the medicines, and also increase the plant's natural resistance to pest and disease. If you can grow such healthy plants, that the bricks is at 12% or higher, in the sap of the plant, sucking insects won't even recognize the plant as food. 
In the Netherlands, it's against the law to use any fungicide on food crops. But once they started experimenting with biostimulants, they went from losing 40% of the crop to powdery mildew to losing zero. They got a 10% increase in yield over any past year, and they were first in the line for bricks, for sugar content in the, in the plant and in the fruit. So not only are we improving the health of the plant, we're making the fruit and the flowers and the medicines uh, uh, better for us as human beings as we consume them. So let's move on to the individual minerals. Let's start with nitrogen. Nitrogen is the growth element. In the first half of a plant's growth, the plant will assimilate about 80% of the nitrogen it needs for the whole life of the plant. That's why most grow formulas, whether they're hydroponic or organic, they're proportionally higher in nitrogen. But during heavy fruit and flower production, or during heavy growth, especially a, a vegetative growth stage, the plants can deplete nitrogen to deficient levels. And when that happens, you get a general yellowing of the leaves. It starts at the bottom of the plant and works its way up. Also, if you're doing flushing, nitrate nitrogen is very water soluble. So if you flush it, nitrate nitrogen is one of the first things to go. And again, if you go too early, you can develop a nitrogen deficiency. But here's the good news. If the plant has a true nitrogen deficiency, just one dose of nitrogen, the plant will start to respond within two or three hours that quickly. And the symptoms should go away in just a matter of a few days. So it's better as a beginner, if you're during the vegetative growth stage, use half-strength nutrients. It's better to keep the nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen at the adequate levels. If you overdo it with nitrogen, and that's one of the biggest mistakes for beginners, even in hydroponics, over fertilizing. If you use full strength or extra strength growth formula, you'll get uh, big cells, thin cell walls. It actually makes it more attractive to the insects. It actually attracts the fungi. Uh, it makes it an easier meal. That's because about 25 to 30 percent of the energy of photosynthesis goes just to assimilate the nitrates whether the plant needs them or not. So keep your base fertilizers low, especially during vegetative growth, half strength to medium strength. And then if they need a little taste of nitrogen, just give them what they need. They'll come right back. Uh, this particular nitrogen, the raw nitrogen, is the ammonium form of the nitrogen. So it's safe to use as a foliar feed as well. You can spray it on the leaves, the ammonium is absorbed through the leaf tissue, it's converted into amino acids, into enzymes, into chlorophyll, very fast response. So again, when you're using your base nutrients, keep them low EC, keep them mild to medium. And if they need a little bit of nitrogen at the right time, just give them a taste and they will respond very, very quickly. Okay, next is phosphorus. Phosphorus is the energy element. It energizes the rooting process. It energizes flowering. So one of the best times to use just a little extra phosphorus, the first two or three weeks. A lot of commercial growers, they, with their fertilizers, they don't have, just have a grow and a bloom, like the hobbyists do. They'll have a starter fertilizer. And what makes it a starter fertilizer, it's a little bit higher in this, monoammonium phosphate. The ammonium actually aids with the uptake of the phosphorus. So it energizes rooting. You get better root strike, better establishment of the plant. I've used just a little bit, less than a sixteenth of a teaspoon of uh, monoammonium phosphate in my fertilizers in the first two or three weeks. I saw 20% more root growth at transplant. So let's learn from the pros. Let's make, make a little bit of a starter fertilizer by just adding a, a touch, a very small amount of a phosphorus stimulant. The other time to use extra phosphorus, early flowering. Phosphorus stimulates earlier flowering in more flowering sites. It energizes the flowering process. Now this particular phosphorus, the raw phosphorus, very high purity. You put this in water, it'll dissolve crystal clear, and it'll be immediately available to the plant. Next comes potassium. Now potassium is the health element. It contributes to the quality of fruit and flowers more than any other element. 
That's because potassium is a catalyst for carbohydrate metabolism to actually make the sugars and to release the stored sugars so they can be shipped to the flowers and stored in the fruit. During heavy fruiting and flowering, plants can deplete potassium to deficient levels in two or three days that quickly. And if you're pushing your plants with high light, with CO2, if you're using bloom stimulants or the biostimulants, they'll deplete potassium even faster. So we want to put back in what the plant took out. We want to use a potassium boost. Now sometimes, even if there's not a symptom showing of the potassium deficiency, the plants can develop a hidden hunger. They can stall. And I hear it all the time. The plants are growing, they're filling in with, with fruit and flowers, then all of a sudden, nothing seems to be happening. They just don't seem to be growing or filling in. It could be a hidden hunger. They just need a little potassium. So you give them a potassium boost, it sparked carbohydrate metabolism, the sugar flows to the flowers, they start to grow again. And you can see a difference 12 hours overnight if that's the problem because it's a catalyst it sparks the whole flowering process restarts it if, if the plant stalls now this particular potassium is mined from an organic source there's no chemical extraction process so it's suitable for soil you can use it in hydroponics very water soluble and it's also suitable for organic plant nutrition because even in organics plants are going to need uh, potassium at the right time if you want the best of the best quality we really want to keep the, the potassium to nitrate ratio high as the plants are pulling down the potassium we want to put that back in because that will keep the better quality fruit and flowers if you had a potassium deficiency in tomatoes you get watery fruit low sugar content and poor shelf life but if you can keep that potassium to nitrogen ratio high you can have the best of the best of quality. Okay, next comes calcium and magnesium. Uh, calcium gets locked up very easily in the soil. It locks up with phosphates to make calcium phosphate. That's what your bones are made out of. 95% water insoluble. And if it's insoluble, that means it's unavailable to the plant. So, also the calcium can react with sulfates to make calcium sulfate. That's gypsum. Plaster of Paris is made from that. 98% unavailable to the plant. So it gets locked up easily. But plants need a continuous supply of water-soluble calcium. Uh, the raw calcium here is derived from calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate is 98% soluble and immediately available to the plant. Now when the plants take up calcium, the calcium reacts with pectic acid to make pectin. That's the glue that glues the cell walls together. It strengthens cell walls. So if you get good calcium uptake, you'll have thicker stems, thicker cell walls on the leaves, a stronger vascular system. And that means plants can take up water and all of the other minerals more efficiently. So calcium is king. Now it isn't just adding calcium to the nutrient though, or just adding it to the soil. It's getting it into the plant. That matters. Calcium is passive. It's only taken up in the transpiration stream. The plant's pulling up the water and transpiring it from the leaves. That's when the calcium is transported. So two things to watch. Relative humidity, number one. You want to keep the relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent. If the humidity is too high, you'll get a calcium deficiency because they can't bring up calcium all the way to the end of the flowers all the way to the end of the fruit. It shows up as tip burn and lettuce. It shows up as blossom end rod and tomatoes. It's calcium deficiency. And it shows up in the new growth on the plants, the new bud development, uh, because it's, it's not mobile. It, the plant's only taken up in the trans, the uh, calcium's only taken up in the transpiration stream. Now there's one other thing you can do though, to get the calcium into the plant. And that's add amino acids. Amino acids are intermediate chelators. The chela means claw. So a chelate attaches to a mineral ion like a claw. It holds it tightly enough so it doesn't react with other minerals, but loosely enough so it's available to the plant on demand. And the amino acid pro product from raw is the amino. Uh, it will actually stimulate 
the uptake of nutrients, especially calcium. Two of the amino acids in here, glutamic acid and glycine, not only chelate calcium to keep it soluble, they also stimulate root cells to open up calcium ion channels. So plant will take up calcium a thousand times faster than simple osmosis. Instead of one ion at a time of calcium going into the root, the channels opened up, it flows into the root and up through the transpiration stream. Also a great application for amino acids is as a hard water additive. I have hard water. It's high in calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. But it makes lime scale, especially when I'm adding my acids for my hydroponics. I can literally see crystals of calcium phosphate forming and falling out of solution like snowflakes. But when I add amino acids first, no more lime scale. So it keeps the calcium soluble and then stimulates the plant to take up more calcium. The thickest stems you'll ever see, the strongest plants. And this is the secret ingredient in the biostimulants that they're using in the Netherlands to prevent powdery mildew. Um, if there's powdery mildew spore lands on a leaf, it wants to send out a germination tube to penetrate the, the cells, get to the water in the interstitial space, and then it germinates and spreads. It becomes systemic in the tissue. But if you get more calcium uptake because of amino acids, you, get, you have instead of water in the interstitial space, you have pectin. So by the time the germination tube penetrates the cells, it dries up and dies. So it doesn't kill powdery mildew, it's not a poison, it just strengthens the plant's natural resistance to powdery mildew so it can't get it become systemic and spread. So it's, a, it's, it's great. If you have trouble with powdery mildew, you want to get your calcium up into your plant. Humidity, air movement, amino acids. Uh, this uh, amino acids also because they're stimulating the uptake of nutrients and the calcium, you're getting that thicker stems and leaves. That's the vascular system. If you have a stronger vascular system, plants take up water and all the other minerals more efficiently, more chemical reactions are done, the bricks goes up, the sugar content and the sap. So this is one of the keys to growing the best of the best of quality along with some of the other biostimulants and minerals that we've been talking about. Next comes silica. Now silica is a beneficial element. It works along with calcium to strengthen stems and leaves. Uh, it, this particular silica, the biogenic silica, is flowable silica. When you put it in water, some of it will dissolve immediately and be immediately available to the plant. So let's say the plant's under attack by, by powdery mildew, for example. When the plant's under attack, the plant will mobilize silica to the point of infection, crystallize the cells around the infection point and help prevent the disease from spreading. So it's part of the plant's natural immune system, the response. As long well, they've strengthened it in general, the plants, so the leaves stand up a little better, they're going to harvest more light energy, but it's a very good insurance policy for the plants. But they're, the flowable silica has some added benefits though. The parts that don't dissolve in the water get trapped in the roots. And those particles are pH neutral. It's the perfect house for plant growth promoting rhizobacteria in the root zone. So, uh, in fact, this same grade of silica, a biogenic silica, is used as a carrier for many microbial inoculants. That's how friendly it is to microorganisms. Also, the same grade of silica, this very fine powdery grade, is used in water filtration. If you look at those tiny particles under a microscope, you'll see pores, holes going through them. So as the water is flowing through the particles in the root zone, it traps some of the minerals, iron, copper, manganese, zinc. Those trace elements activate the enzymes that the microorganisms produce and activate enzymes in the plant. And if an enzyme is turned on, if it's activated, one molecule of an enzyme can do a thousand chemical reactions per second. But if it's not activated, doesn't have those trace elements, it just sits there. So that's why this is beneficial to the plant because it's helping to make some of the trace elements more available right in the root zone. Next comes kelp. 
Now kelp is in almost all the biostimulant products that are on the shelf. It's an integral part of the root stimulants, it's in the growth stimulants, it's in, even in the bloom stimulants. Kelp has lots of different applications. It's loaded with natural growth hormones and beneficial trace elements from the seed. One of the applications is to use it as a seed soak. It has gibberellic acid in it, naturally. So if you have some seeds that are a little bit old, or maybe weren't stored quite properly, just soak them overnight in kelp. You'll get earlier germination and a better overall germination rate. Very simple. The other application, probably the best one for the kelp, is as a root stimulant. It's loaded with auxins and cytokinins. So if you use this at the roots, you're going to get more lateral root growth from the auxins and more root mass from the cytokinins. It's the key ingredient in many of the expensive root stimulants on the, on, the, uh, on the shelves in the hydroponic stores. The third application is as a foliar spray. Kelp is high in cytokinins. If you spray it on the tissue, uh, on the leaves of the plant, then the cytokinins break the apical dominance, the top growth, but it stimulates lateral bud development, the lateral branching. Also, cytokinins literally pull nutrients into the developing tissue. It pulls in the sugars, pulls in the amino acids, pulls in the minerals and the water. So it has a downstream effect on quality and yield even after you stop using it as a foliar. Now this is very potent, this particular kelp. This is a powdered kelp, full potency, and you mix it in water. So this one I recommend low dose as a foliar, less is more. Use it no more than once a week as a foliar. Even once every two or three weeks will still have a beneficial effect on the plant. Now to improve the effectiveness of kelp, combine it with humic acid. Virginia Tech did a 10-year study on biostimulants and they found that five parts humic acid with two parts kelp worked 50 percent better than either product alone. They're synergistic. They have an amplifying effect on each, on each other. Remember the kelp has the hormones, the auxins and the cytokinins? Humic acid holds onto those growth hormones in an exchangeable form. Makes it easier for the plant to take up. Also, humic acid literally stimulates enzymes in the root mem cell membranes, in the roots, to increase the voltage across the cell membranes so the plant can take up minerals much more effectively. The humic acid is an intermediate chelator, just like the amino acids. But it, the humic acid are larger molecules, though. They make a bridge between the clay particles in your soil and the minerals. It makes it easier for the plants to take up. Also, they have over 60 beneficial trace elements from ancient compost piles. Now, if you want to use kelp as a foliar spray, I'd recommend combining it with fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is the more refined fraction of humic acid. They're smaller, more biologically active molecules. So when you use it as a foliar spray, it literally will transport the iron and the trace minerals through the cell membranes, release it inside the cell where it's needed the most. Now, the color you see here in the fulvic and the fulvic acid, iron. If the plant transports the iron through the cell membranes or stimulates the uptake of iron, like it does in nature, the iron is a catalyst for chlorophyll production. That's the green pigment. So if the plant makes more chlorophyll, it's going to harvest more of your light energy. So instead of adding more lights, stimulate the plant to harvest more of the lights. It'll make more sugars. Uh, if they make more sugars, some will be used for energy to grow and reproduce. Some will be stored in the flowers and the fruit. And also, iron is critical for not just cellular metabolism, for growth, but also to activate enzymes that are plant protection agents against stress, and also making the medicinal compounds that are very important in the medicinal herbs. So optimum iron is critical for optimum quality. Now, um, all, the other thing you can do with this iron, remember, you use the 5 to 2 ratio, humic acid or fulvic acid to the kelp. It'll stimulate the plant to make 50% more of an enzyme that protects the plant against stress. 
will protect the plant against heat stress, salt stress, drought stress, UV stress from the lights. It will protect the membranes, the, the plant will stay green longer, and it will recover from the stress faster. So a good time to use that combination is before you're going to have stress. You know the plants are going to grow up into the lights. You know it's going to get warm in the summer. So start to use them at the early on before the stress. They'll develop more roots. They'll be more resistant to drought. They'll make more plant protection agents and so they can be more resistant to stress. They'll stay green longer. They'll recover faster. Okay, next comes yucca. Yucca is a natural wetting agent. It makes water wetter. It's very good for flushing away excess mineral salts. Very good to add to your foliar spray. When you add it to your water for irrigation, the, it breaks the polarity of the water molecules. So the water disperses through the entire root zone, all the way through your, your growing medium. So if you're adding your nutrients, you're adding the kelp and the humic acid, then the amino acids, then that will spread through the entire root zone, getting to all the developing root hairs. It'll actually stimulate more root production. And even it's even used as an ingredient in compost tea because it's a slow carbohydrate source for the microorganisms in the root zone. So again, very gentle on the roots, very friendly to the microbes. You can also use it in a foliar spray, any of the foliar sprays that you use. Instead of the water beating up on the waxy surface of the leaf, it spreads out on a thin film. It's more evenly and efficiently taken up by the plant. So it's great to use either way. In fact, commercial growers will even add it to their irrigation water because it helps keep the drip emitters clean. It washes away the, the excess buildup of salts. So they stay open, they stay clean. It also cleans the roots. Uh, this is very potent form of yucca. It's food grade yucca. Uh, one sixteenth of a teaspoon treats five gallons of water. So a little yucca goes a long, long way. Okay, next, really quickly, B vitamins. B vitamins are biologically active molecules, they're organic molecules, that stimulate cellular metabolism. Now when you use this in soil, most of the B vitamins will be used by the microorganisms in the root zone. It stimulates metabolism, so they start vibrating with energy. And when they vibrate with energy, they grow and they start to divide. Pop, pop, pop. And as the microbes are actively dividing, that's when they're making the organic acids that will aid with the uptake of minerals. That's when they make digestive enzymes that break down large molecules into smaller ones that the plants can use. It actually makes your organic fertilizers more organic because they break it down faster. They even make rooting hormones right on the surface of the roots. They literally make IAA. And they make plant protection agents that rescue the plant from stress and rescue and release the plant for normal plant growth. So this is a great thing, again, to use before the problem, before the stress. It's a great insurance policy. One thing it does directly on the plant, one, one dose of B vitamins, it's high in B1, just one time, it will protect the plant for 10 days. It stimulates what's called the plant's systemic induced resistance or systemic induced response. In other words, it primes the plant. It puts, sensitizes it. It puts the plant on high alert. So if it comes under attack by a root pathogen, if it comes under stress, the plant's natural immune system will respond instantly. So it doesn't literally protect the plant from transplant shock, but it sensitizes the plant. So if it, uh, a root pathogen starts to invade it, the plant's natural immune system will respond quickly. Okay, last is the cane molasses. Cane molasses is a carbohydrate. It feeds the microorganisms. The microorganisms feed the plant. It's very highly concentrated. 10 pounds of liquid molasses makes one pound of micronized molasses, and it's very high in soluble iron. In fact, most of the plant physiology uh, professors and the agronomists attribute the benefits of cane molasses more to the iron than to the carbohydrates themselves. As the microbes eat the cane molasses, they make what's, and they start to divide, pop, 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 they make a molecule called a siderophore. That literally means iron carrier. It's one of the best chelators 
of iron in nature. They also make volatile organic compounds that communicate with the plant, the microbes do. They tell the plant, take up more iron. So it'll do more photosynthesis. It'll make more sugars. It'll sweeten up and some will be leaked to feed the microbes. Some of the best times to add a little cane molasses during flowering, especially toward the end. The plant starts to hoard its carbohydrates, it stops feeding the microbes and they go to sleep. So that's one way we can improve on nature. When the plant stops feeding the microbes, we can give them a little bit of cane molasses to keep the plant photosynthetically active all the way to the day of harvest. Uh, to summarize here though, if you want to try to combine everything in a very simple way, there's all-in-one grow, all-in-one bloom, the growth is proportionally higher in nitrogen, the bloom is proportionally higher in phosphorus and potassium, but it has all the organic biostimulants we were talking about today too. So that's a really simple way to, to provide full plant nutrition to the plants, especially in soil or in a soilless medium because it's going to feed the microbes while it's feeding the plant.